FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Welcome, and you are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz. It's January 17th, 2018. Big things happening in the crypto space. Big things happening in precious metals. Well, hey, as always, join the show. Email us, kl at kerrylutz.com. Well, what's going to happen with cryptos? Bitcoin down to 10,000. Ethereum, all the others, major crashes. In the meantime, gold silver showing a lot of strength in in the face of not so bullish news for it which just shows you what the news is worth rick rules here sprott global rick uh, welcome back to the show thank you carrie it's a pleasure being on with you hey so you saw the crash i mean you know it's last time i looked and i try not to look at bitcoin too much during the day because sometimes you wind up only watching it because the moves are so volatile and dramatic but when i looked five minutes ago and i'll i'll say it's probably accurate it was down to ten thousand five hundred from nearly twenty thousand and well i thought i thought bitcoin was like real estate before the crash of 07 i thought uh, bitcoin cryptocurrencies only went up rick well carrie i get, i guess that's a, a a function of your own perception you know about once a decade real estate falls too and it falls fairly precipitously it's interesting when people describe bitcoin as down and by the way, Kerry, you know I'm no expert in Bitcoin, and you know I think that I don't own any. Uh, about a year ago, maybe a little more, Bitcoin was trading hands at about $400 a coin. And then it went up to 18000 and now it's down to ten. So you need to decide from your own point of view whether it fell from eighteen or 19000 to 10000 or whether it rose from 400 <laughs> to 10,000. I guess both is true. It depends on your perspective. That very volatility teaches us a lot of things. Uh, one is just a sort of a, fascina a fascinating subject for discussing behavioral finance. The fact that an asset class where you don't have a lot of history to draw on to understand pricing signals the second is, of course, the wonderful discrepancy between price, which you can see, and value, which is hard to ascertain. And the third, of course, is the investor's response to volatility. Nobody who's long seems to mind upside volatility, but downside volatility becomes a curse. Uh, I come in commodities from a business that is at once extremely cyclical. Uh, and also very volatile. But I must admit, the volatility associated with Bitcoin as the lead horse in the crypto race, uh, but also the volatility in the other crypto-related currencies has been a real eye-opener for me. And I wonder uh, how perception of that volatility sits with people who regard cryptocurrencies as currency, because my own suspicion is until the volatility eases out, cryptos really become trading tokens rather than mediums of exchange. Three months ago, people were afraid to buy stuff with Bitcoin because they thought the price the, <laughs> the price of the coin would go up, and hence the price that, of the item that they bought with the coin would also go up. And if part of its utility as, is as a medium of exchange, uh, the price escalation, in fact, would seem to me to have devalued it as a medium, medium of exchange. This isn't, by the way, expressing a point of view. Um, I don't have a point of view. It's just an observation from somebody who has made his living in capital markets for 40 years about what I regard as a fascinating asset class. Hey, you make such a great point. I think the label, all right, language is everything in so many matters. It's certainly in emerging markets as cryptocurrencies. They shouldn't be called cryptocurrencies because they're not currencies. And yet, if you didn't call them cryptocurrencies, if you called them crypto tokens, or I don't know what else you want to call them, uh, 
but just say crypto tokens, all of a sudden it doesn't sound so sexy. And it kind of brings a little objectivity to this. Like you said, it's not a medium of exchange because just like, honestly, if we really look at precious metals, they're no longer a medium of exchange either, but in certain quarters can be used as such. But generally, most of the population, uh, as illustrated by those Mark Dice videos and David Morgan videos, where they're trying to give away an ounce of silver or gold and the people take the candy, I mean, they're not a medium of exchange either, but certainly you can't deny the store of value. With, with the cryptos, like you said, the problem was like a month ago, who would who would spend them? You'd have to be crazy to to spend them when they're going up, uh, you know, fifty percent a month or even ten twenty percent a day. Uh, it it does undermine their their usefulness or their utility as a medium of exchange, which is the first and foremost purpose of a quote unquote currency. We're uh, at Sprut actually trying to address this we uh, i think i've told you this before we're involved in a joint venture with iex the uh, electronic exchange operator made famous by flash boys uh, in the development of something called the trade winds token which is a, a crypto token that is fully backed by gold uh, and is redeemable through the facilities of the Royal Canadian Mint, uh, so that we have the advantages of the blockchain and the distributed ledger, which theoretically greatly lowers transaction costs and clearing and settlement costs, while at the same time represents a medium of exchange that is simultaneously the store of value. Uh, we expect to debut this token, in fact, in the next 10 days, and we're highly excited about it. It amuses me that one of the objections to it is, in fact, that it is tethered to gold. And as a consequence of that, doesn't <laughs> exhibit the volatility that the untethered coins have exhibited. This is sort of an amusing objection to me, although I understand it from a speculator's point of view. Our goal has been to uh, affect a more efficient means of gold ownership and gold transaction in smaller units that were more efficient so that we could create the beginnings of a gold-backed cryptocurrency. Uh, we imagine as strictly transfer a token that represented, say, a gram of gold or even a fraction of a gram of gold would be much more efficient than sending out dividends that were, in fact, physical. And we think blockchain, that the distributed ledger, uh, forms the technology where people who are interested in a currency that is simultaneously of value and a medium of exchange can affect their preference. We'll see if we're right, but it's, it's been an extremely interesting project to be involved in for 12 months. Hey, well, it seems like, and I'm not the best trader, but it seems like uh, it will no doubt have great arbitraging potential because it's either going to trade at a premium to the price of metal or it's going to trade at a discount. And therefore, uh, the knowledgeable traders are going to go look to try to capitalize on that imbalance, if you will. Do you think it can trade long term at a premium or is it going to just track the price of, uh, of gold? It is arguable that it could trade at a premium because of the ease with which you trade it. Most people who want to own gold are constrained, A, from owning it, but also from transacting in it because of the very high transaction costs. Mostly, mm -hmm. if one of your listeners goes out to buy 10 ounces of physical gold, he or she pays spot plus 300 basis points to the dealer. The specie, which involves selling it back to a dealer for spot less 300 basis points, Meaning that the implicit promise of gold ownership in the short term is that you cost yourself 6% if you want to transact in it. Our hope is that our token, because it's redeemable, 
uh, were it ever to trade at a discount of sort of more than 1% to the price of gold, would allow arbitrageurs to short physical gold while buying the token, surrender the token, and then use the gold that it was surrendered for to fill in the arbitrage. Certainly, if you look historically at the difference in the price p- performance, between the Sprott-sponsored, exchange-traded physical gold, silver, and platinum and palladium trusts versus all of their competition, which were not redeemable. Our competition uh, traded generally at between a 10 and 15% discount to the price of the metal, while we consistently uh, traded in a band between a 1.5% premium and a 1.5% discount. So I think the convertibility, the redeemability of our token for physical gold will eliminate all or almost all of the discount. We are hopeful because of the liquidity aspects combined with the redeemability that we're actually able to trade at a small premium to the price of gold. But please understand, this isn't a prediction on my point of view. This is the hope. Of course. And what I find interesting about it, so presumably there's going to be a vault with gold stored in some place. Uh, I, I stored at the Royal Canadian Mint. Right. Uh, so. we, we say jokingly that our security is provided by NATO. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, that just reminds me, I was watching uh, Goldfinger the other day. And, uh, you know, every time it's on, you just see different things and it's just hysterical. But yeah, short of uh, Ulrich uh, Goldfinger trying to grab the Royal Canadian Mint's gold, I think we're pretty safe there. So this also opens up another question. What do we need ETFs for then? Uh, Maybe all the ETFs, um, ones that actually are holding the metal, need to convert to a token and thereby eliminate their uh, their discount that they're trading at and uh, and become freely convertible and exchangeable and tradable well that's the beauty of the uh, blockchain and distributed ledger technology it does have the ability to greatly disintermediate listed products uh, like the etfs And to the extent that, as an example, a sponsoring organization or a financial services organization like Sprott experiences a precipitous decline in the cost of offering and administering uh, liquid products, uh, then our ability to pay uh, to pass on those savings to the ultimate owner, the consumer, is very high. If you uh, add back a feature that you and I find attractive that some other people don't find attractive, which is the anonymity uh, of both ownership and exchange. Uh, that utility, both for individual speculators and investors, but also for society at large, is very, very large. The difficulty that we have right now uh, in terms of our product relative to the principal physical ETF, the XAU, is that the XAU is a security and people can hold it in securities accounts. At present, our token isn't a security, and we don't have arrangements yet with any of the large financial services institutions, although we've approached the Royal Bank of Canada. Mm -hmm. Uh, We don't have the ability for individual holders to hold the token other than in wallets. We don't have the ability for them to hold the tokens as a security in securities accounts. But I think that the, the technology... Uh, and the community to facilitate this will develop over the next five years. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, the beauty of it, you know, we heard lots of rumors, Rick, over the past uh, since Bitcoin's getting popular of a bullion backed token being introduced, right. but it, it really hasn't happened. So I applaud the fact that you're making it happen and assuming it trades freely and uh, uh, you can figure out how to hold on to your wallet to stop it from getting hacked. Yes. It, it offers so much better a means of, of holding precious metals because, look, it's simple. On your part, you got your depository, which is audited, and you can audit it real time 
effectively. You've got the blockchain, which ties into the audit trail of the metal. So you know that it's there, right? Because each token, let's say it's an ounce token, or it could be a kilo token or a a thousand ounce token, right? Doesn't really matter. But if it's a thousand ounce token, its serial number is directly linked to the physical bar that's that's on deposit at, uh, you know, the depository. So at the mint, and yeah, it just it takes the uh, the credibility issues that you have with GLD, et cetera, and go on and name SLV, you know, just list the ETFs or closed end funds. All that credibility issue is gone at that point. And then the blockchain is really fulfilling its biggest promise, which is transparency and integrity of the system. The gold is there. We know it's there both on the physical end. I mean, heck, you could just have a monitor in the in the vault because presumably you're not going to be adding currency units here. Once once you create the uh, unit, then then that's it. There's X number of units, right? Uh, um, we certainly would be able to add extra units up to the capacity of gold in the Royal Canadian Mint. We can't go over and above that, but to the extent that somebody was to convert currency into a unit and we converted it into gold at the Royal Canadian Mint, the Royal Canadian Mint could use that payment to buy additional gold. We, uh, (laughs) <laughs> we should be so lucky. <laughs> well, uh, the the truth is that we would love to see this be a very, very, very large financial product. We don't foresee capacity becoming a problem, however. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, it's fascinating, and uh, and it should trade along with gold, and you know, it it leads to all these add-on products afterwards that you're not really going to be involved with but i could see uh links to debit cards in the tokens like they're attempting to do now with bitcoin and credit cards and perhaps even bank accounts at some point your speculation as to what our intentions might be with regards to ancillary products is probably both premature and conservative. Uh, We have thought about ways to use this product to um, add utility to our own clients and to benefit from adding utility to our clients. (laughs) (laughs) Just, uh, you know, it's worth noting, uh, Carrie, that Sprott's existing exchange traded physical passive products have about 160,000 shareholders. And one of our primary reasons for being invested in this is that we are deeply a part of the precious metals community. And the precious metals community, but more specifically the 160,000 shareholders of our physical products, have already expressed an interest in and a preference for this type of product. Uh, this particular product, for better or for worse, was not designed by five pimply-faced kids <laughs> commandeering a garage in Silicon Valley because they thought the technique, was, the, the technology was cool. <laughs> this product came about as a consequence of an expressed need from a consumer group. And rather than the technology looking for a market, this is a market that went looking for a technology. It's different from the other cryptos in that regard. I'm not trying to say it's better or it's worse, but it really is a technology in response to a market rather than a market developing to utilize a technology. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it, I can totally see that and the utility of it, the storage issues that one encounters when you decide you want to invest in precious metals and you want to take physical delivery, which you're probably still going to want to have some physical in your portfolio, but maybe a lot less than you would have otherwise once once this gains acceptance, which with 160,000 clients lined up, uh, many of whom were demanding this effectively, the market demanding it, uh, I think acceptance is going to be much easier for this among the precious metals community than, uh, than, say, Bitcoin. And I think you will get other people in cryptocurrencies who had no interest in precious metals whatsoever. They're going to take a serious look at this because there's stability 
presumably there's going to be stability and the chance of appreciation, of course, if metals go up, which we're expecting. So the whole concept uh, I just find intriguing and I can't wait to see when it's released. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll definitely touch back with somebody once it comes out and, and really uh, get under the hood and show people how to do it. So getting back to the original premise of precious metals for 2018, 2017 was a very stable year, uh, what uh, technicians call an inside year, meaning that the high in 2017 didn't exceed the high in 2016, and the low did not go below the low of 2016. Pretty significant. And then we start out the year, definitely seasonal forces at play, but it's shown a lot of relative strength. So what's, what's your take on 2018 without asking you for numbers or anything else? Because I think it's it's kind of silly to pick numbers. Terry, the job of gold is to be an inside trade. And gold did its job in 2017 in US dollars very well. If you exit the realm of US dollars uh, and think about the currencies that most of the world's world trades in, uh, gold had uh, what was often record years because those currencies underperformed both the dollar and gold. Uh, I, I think that gold had really, uh, and I don't mean it to be a play on words, but had a sterling year <laughs> in the sense that the gold price performed well during a period of time when confidence was high, particularly confidence as expressed by the U.S. dollar, which was softer, uh, and confidence expressed in the U.S. 10-year treasury, which, as you know, I believe to be the world's benchmark security. The fact that gold preserved its sense as a store of value during a period of time when the circumstances that normally caused the gold price to occur, uh, to, to rise, pardon me, did not occur, uh, says a lot about the fact that uh, gold did precisely what it is supposed to do for people in 2018. There were, if nothing else, uh, by a sense of calm. If you look at the VIX as an example in 2017, the VIX was somnolescent. Uh, there was incredible liquidity in the markets. We can argue, at least I could argue, that much of the liquidity was artificial, but that doesn't matter. Uh, the fact that there was a lot of liquidity in the markets meant that the market did very well and there was a lot of confidence in the market. That notwithstanding, gold did well too, uh, which from my point of view speaks to the franchise that gold uh, enjoys. I think the second thing that 2017 ought to remind us about with regards to the gold market, and I think the reason that gold did relatively well despite the fact that the circumstances weren't useful to the gold narrative, is the fact that gold and, well, call it precious metals generally and precious metals related equities are a very under-owned asset class. Mm -hmm. And the consequence of that is that a fairly small uh, amount of demand was sufficient to maintain the price. It has been estimated, and I forget who authored this study, although I think it was Morgan Stanley. It has been estimated that in the U.S. savings and investment market, between one third and one half of one percent of the invested assets in the United States are invested in precious metals and precious metals equities. In a historic concept, uh, in a historic sense, this contrasts with about 8% allocation in 1981 at the peak and a three decade mean of about 1.5%. This tells us two interesting things. The first is, as an asset class, it's tiny, uh, which may explain its relatively good performance last year relative to other asset classes that were more popular. But secondly, it talks to something about what we might expect in 2018 or 2019, 
if, as, and when the narrative associated with gold and other markets changed, if demand for precious metals and precious metals-related equities returned to its three-decade mean, uh, not to its 35-year-old peak, that would mean that demand for precious metals and precious metals equities could grow approximately threefold in the largest investment market in the world. Yeah, yeah, well, uh, totally with you because uh, it's become a very complacent, ignored, and basically the investor sentiment towards it is really one of pure indifference. You know, it's like a relationship, you know, be angry at me, be happy with it, be happy with me, but just don't ignore me. And yet that's what we've got here. I'm not going to do any relationship counseling, Gary. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, well, the analogy, I think, holds. So anyways, we find you over at SprottGlobal.com. Hey, if you got any questions for Rick or myself, uh, email us, KL at Carrie Lutz. Twitter feeds at Carrie Lutz. And the Facebook page is Financial Survival Network. Rick, thanks so much for taking time out for your busy day to opine and uh, engage. We always appreciate it. And we will talk to you again real soon. Always a pleasure, Kerry. I enjoy these conversations. Thank you for having me on. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next.